Hi everybody, welcome back to the bench. Um, I am currently in the process of filming part two of the Fisher X101C video. Um, waiting for a couple of parts to come in and uh, I'm going to be doing some footage down in the shop of, you know, a couple things. And uh, I just didn't feel like going down to the shop today. The weather <laughs> outside, there's some really ominous clouds overhead. Um, we just had a couple of really hard cloud bursts come through and there's a big one on the radar coming through and I have a feeling that cloud's going to get over top of us and there's going to be major sky area all over us. So I'm going to stay down here in the nice dry shop at the bench here in the basement and uh, I thought we would take some time to do some tube talk about uh, vacuum tubes. If you recall on part one of the Fisher video, these tubes were the output tubes that came with the unit and three of them as you can see are original Fisher tubes and they are in good condition at least from what I could see trying them out and then the fourth one was a JJ model 7591 now I made a couple comments about 7591 tubes being kind of like a, being a pentode tube and being kind of situated between like a 6BQ5 EL34 or EL84 and like an EL34 and um, it got me to thinking there's a lot of information floating around out there about output tubes in general so I'm going to do two things in this video first part we're going to talk about the different types of power tubes um, first of the first type being a pentode tube okay co so we of course have the triode tubes like your 300 B and your 211 and the uh, the type 45 a lot of common ones and those are triode tubes they have three elements they have an anode a cathode and they have a control grid um, but what we're going to talk about is two very specific types. We're going to kind of skip over the actual uh, tetrode tube because those aren't very common and there's not a lot of those really out there anymore. Um, for instance, I think the type 47 is a tetrode tube. Um, but we're going to talk about the pentode and we're going to talk about the beam tetrode or the beam tube or the kinkless tetrode tube. There's a whole bunch of names that it goes by and there's a lot of different interchangeable terms that can make you be, you can really confuse you quite a bit um, if you're not really familiar with what they're talking about. So if that sounds interesting to you, stay tuned. And then in part two of this video, the second half of this video, I'm actually going to go through this box. These are my spare 7591s. And I'm going to try to find, I'm going to first, we're going to measure these three on the tube tester. And then we're going to try to find one that kind of matches them somewhat. And no, I don't have a multi thousand dollar Amplitrex tube tester or a modified TV7 or, you know. But I do have a very carefully calibrated and restored um, Heathkit TT1. And it's a very good and very accurate, you know, tube tester. Actually, I've had pretty good results with it. It's not nearly like some of these advanced ones, but we're going to use it. It is a, a mutual uh, conductance tube tester, and we'll go through that. All right, let's get started. So the first thing I want to talk about, and again, this video, I'm going to just start off by saying this is a a viewer participation friendly video. I want participation. I want you all to, to comment, to add as much as you can to this. I'm going to be the first to admit I'm not a brilliant genius when it comes to tubes. Um, you know, I, I know from x-ray uh, some things about tubes, but a lot of that, even though it's very similar to these tubes, uh, they work somewhat different than these. But the same principles can apply. So anyway, we're going to talk about the two types of tubes and I want you all to join in in the comments and so forth. If there's some things that I miss, you can correct me and, uh, you know, if there's things you can add or uh, whatever, please feel free because I'm here to learn just as much as you guys. 
All right. So, two tube types, the pentode and the beam tetrode, or beam power tube, or the kinked tetrode tube, or I'm sorry, kinkless tetrode tube. All of those terms um, are kind of interchangeable. And really, what is the difference between these things? So, if we look at these tubes, these 7591s, or if we look at this, which is a 7189, which is it's a good RCA tube, which this is the same as a 6BQ5, which is the same as an EL84. These are true pentode tubes. Pentode, from the word penta, meaning five. It's because these have five elements. They have an anode, a cathode, and they have three grids, okay? And why do we need all these grids? What, what do they do? Let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, I'm going to scrap this last clip that I did and start over again because I kind of looked over it and it just didn't make sense to me. So I'm going to kind of redo this how I'm going to talk about these tubes. So let's start with the very basics. And I'm going to kind of go from an x-ray tube standpoint because that's what I'm good at and work my way forward to, uh, to regular, x regular tubes like this. So... To understand the difference between a pentode and a beam tetrode and all these things, triode, you first need to understand the most basic tube, and that's the diode. So let's just start out with just the filament. So if we have a filament here, and we connect it to a power supply, we'll call this voltage number one, V1, you're going to have a current loop going through here, right? and that current is going to cause this filament to heat up. Now when this filament heats up, it's going to actually cause electrons to burn off, kind of become freed from their little bonds, and they're going to kind of form a little cloud, okay, these little dashes, these are little electrons, they're going to form a little electron cloud around the filament. Now, the more current I pass through this filament, the hotter the filament gets, and the hotter the filament gets, the bigger this little electron cloud will get. Now, if I take a, an electrode over here, yes, we're just going to freehand draw all this, and I put it at a set distance from this filament, Okay, so this is just nothing but an electrode. It's just a metal plate. And we're going to call that the anode, correct? This is our filament. And if I connect a wire to this filament, and I bring it up here, and I put another power supply up here, we're going to call that V2. And then we're going to put our load resistor, R, L, so there's your load resistor. And we're going to put that right here like this. Okay, now, if I go ahead and I turn this power on to this, what's going to happen is this side here is going to be more negative this side is going to be more positive. So it's going to have a positive charge to it. Now, this little cloud of electrons in here, they're just kind of hanging out around the filament. And eventually, if this voltage potential goes up high enough, eventually these electrons are going to start to flow, just little bits at a time, from this cathode to this anode. Now this electron cloud around here is what we call our space charge, okay? Space charge. And we can change that space charge in a couple different ways. The first thing we could do is to move this anode closer 
and then that will make it easier because it's a shorter distance so the potential between these uh, will allow this electron cloud to flow sooner with lower voltage or I can increase the voltage over here and that's going to cause these to jump or a third thing now is you can actually increase the filament heat to make this electron cloud the space charge cloud even bigger okay so all three of those things will serve the same purpose to get these electrons to flow and of course the more you heat this filament the more electrons will flow the more quantity so this represents current okay so the current is going to be controlled by the filament if you have a fixed voltage up here now think about this for a second no matter what voltage I put over here if I only have a limited amount of electrons because I don't heat this filament up very much I'm going to have a limited amount of current that can flow and with Ohm's law if this is a fixed resistance here even though the voltage potential might be higher here if my current is really really low then that may that will make the voltage drop across this resistor change based upon current they all kind of work together right all right and that's pretty much how a diode works so it's pretty pretty simple but really I what I want you to take away from this is the space charge and the that electron cloud there so next we want to know what is a triode well a triode is this if we take a little grid we add this grid element here right and we put it in close proximity to our cathode to our heater here right in the middle of this electron cloud if I make this negative with respect to the anode but I make it positive with respect to this to the cathode what's going to happen is it is going to reduce this electron cloud in other words it'll repel these electrons back towards the filament and not allow them to flow as easily to the anode and the harder I turn this negative the more it's going to turn this electron cloud off it's going to repel it back to here the more positive this grid will go so the more positive I put this element over here the more it's going to allow these electrons to pass through and the more current is going to flow to your anode so this little grid by varying the voltage will be able to control this larger voltage up here and that's how that works now if you notice this is pretty close to this cathode down here and in order for this to work you need an awful lot of voltage to control this voltage up here so what that means is that a triode tube because if you if you the more power you want the triode to be able to handle the bigger the distance you have to have between these okay so let's back up one second the point at which electrons start to flow at all between the cathode and the anode we call our emissions point okay so if there's no electrons flowing from the cathode to the anode and then you increase this cloud or you increase the potential here or we turn on our turn our grid more positive the point at which it just barely starts to conduct we call the emissions point okay and the point at which the maximum amount of current will flow before you actually draw an arc between here and here so in other words our current will will keep increasing at a constant and you know a controllable manner until finally 
the voltage, if the voltage is too high, if this potential here is too high, you'll actually cause an arc. And if you have a flashover from here to here, this is no longer working. The cloud no longer means anything. You actually have a lightning bolt here, and this whole thing just acts as a dead short. And then it's just like taking this wire up here, off the camera, this wire up here, and just directly connecting it down here. This whole thing gets bypassed. So really, this thing can only work within that parameter of the, the maximum voltage and the minimum emissions. And in order to get it to work in that range, this, this element here, this control grid, is going to need a whole lot of voltage, which means you're really not going to get a whole lot of gain. Now, to, to make this have more gain, where you need just a little voltage, you would need to move this anode a lot closer. So if we brought the anode down here, it would just take a very tiny amount of voltage to get a lot of electrons to flow. However, the tube won't be able to handle that much power because if you get too much power, it's going to arc over. So it's a trade-off. So in order to have a power output tube, like to drive a speaker, where you have enough energy, enough current and voltage, enough wattage to drive something big like a speaker, you really have to have a substantial amount of voltage going through here and you have to separate that anode from that cathode and that makes this grid right here less efficient. Which is why triode tubes always need to have a lot of drive signal going into them to work. And that's always been a problem. So what they figured out was what happens if we add another grid up here. And we're going to connect that grid to another resistor, okay, and connect it to our voltage. All right, R, S. And we're going to call this a screen grid, okay. So now we have one, two, three, four elements. So four elements, this is going to be a tetrode tube. And this was the first tetrode. And what you do is, when we apply this positive voltage here, this grid is more positive than this grid, and much more positive than this cathode. So that electron cloud is going to be drawn towards this screen grid. That is going to close the gap between here and here. But this, because of this resistor here, the screen grid is going to be less positive than this one, than the anode. So your anode is still more positive than your screen grid. So what that does is that makes the tube, even though you have a bigger distance here, it makes this tube look like it's much, the, the anode is much closer, so it makes the control grid much more efficient so it gives it more gain. So that was a very popular design except for one major flaw. And that is, if you look at what this is, you have one, two, three, four elements. And you have the highest voltage here, then you have a little bit lower voltage here, a lower voltage here, and then the lowest voltage here, which is, this is the most negative. So what you have is actually you have a voltage divider between each of these elements. And when you look at the ratio of voltage difference from here versus the ratio of voltage difference here, as you increase the voltage on your control grid, these will become more and decrease, increase and decrease this this ratio of voltage here to here is going to change. And what that's going to do is that's going to cause what's called negative resistance. What that's going to do is that's going to cause at some point in time, at certain drive voltages, you're going to actually, the current flowing from here to here is going to drop very considerably. And 
when you get on the other side of that, it then begins to act like a triode because now there's not a big, as much of a big difference between these two voltages as there is here, and it starts working again. So if you kind of made, tried to draw a chart of it, as you're increasing your voltage, the current is increasing with it, and then finally you hit this spot where it dips. The current actually dips. You're still raising your voltage, so if this is voltage and this is current, and then eventually you come on the other side of it, and it goes like that. And we call this your anode kink. Okay, that's what they call it. And every tetrode has that flaw in it. So the idea was when you designed an amplifier, you wanted to design it to operate in this range here and to cut out this area here. If not, this area here is going to cause a massive amount of distortion in your amplifier. So it wasn't a very good design and tetrode tubes did not last a very long time. Now along comes Phillips and Mullard and they got the idea of what if, yeah they did the what if thing, what if we put yet another grid, another element, between the screen grid and the anode and we actually take it and we kind of tie it down towards our cathode. So now what's going to happen and of course what we're going what this is going to do is this is going to always ensure that some electrons are up here on the other side of this this uh, screen grid so that when we get in that kinked region the electrons that are kind of floating around here are going to kind of fill in this gap right here and cause it to be more linear. Okay, and now we have one, two, three, four, five elements, and because of that, it is a pentode. All right, now this actually worked really well because you had basically the best of both worlds. You had the linearity of a triode tube but you had the efficiency and gain of a tetrode tube. Now you might ask well okay <laughs> what about this other thing what is a beam tetrode? Well this whole idea of putting it first of all this was very complex and it had to require some pretty accurate machining to get this grid properly positioned in here. If it was the wrong size, if it was the wrong spacing, and if it was the wrong centering, it would actually cause it to not work properly. So as a result, that was a very tough manufacturing process. And besides that, Phillips and Mullard had this concept patented. So that means all the companies like RCA and Sylvania and all these, you know, other guys, GE, all these guys, they could not have this device. So what they did was they came up with another idea. And that was, instead of having this pentode grid right here, this, this actual, um, what is this called? Hold on suppressor grid. I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> Brain fart. Uh, this suppressor grid, they did away with that because obviously that was covered under the patent. And instead of having that, they actually put what was called a beam forming element. And what it was, was it was kind of like a... well, it worked kind of the same as this screen right here um, there was this grid except it was kind of like a metal plate one here and one here and they both connected down to your cathode like that and what that would do is essentially the same thing 
it would cause these stray electrons that were getting caught around this uh, grid when these when you get this imbalance and it would redirect them back towards the anode in very much a similar manner to the way that the pentode works and again guys all you tube experts you know my my deal is with diode tubes because I'm an x-ray guy I work with x-ray which is a diode um, so by no means am I as an expert or as good as most <laughs> a lot of these other guys out there so comment below and uh, we, we would all appreciate anything you guys can add from your knowledge. But anyway, these, these beam formers would actually redirect those electrons back towards this anode and cause it basically have the same result as the suppressor grid. And that's what a, and really this was started out as a way to get around that um, patent that Phillips had on on the pentode tube but what they found was by when they perfected this idea of this beam forming there actually were some instances where it would perform as well and sometimes even better than an original pentode and really to this day even though they both do the same thing and you can kind of you know as long as the pin out of the tube is the same you can interchange a pentode for a beam tetrode they do have different properties as far as capacitance, as far as um, how they work with the output transformer and all that. They are different, and that's why you get a lot of people that are very opinionated about the pentode versus a beam tetrode tube. And sometimes it's a little bit unfounded in that if you plug one device in to a circuit that was specifically designed for the other type of device, Although it will work, although you can measure the same amount of watts output and whatever frequency response, it will not sound the same because the tube is physically a little bit of a different device. So again, when you design the circuit specifically for the type of tube that you're using, all things being equal, a pentode and a beam tetrode will work very similarly to one another. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is that <laughs> there, the terminology has been so abused that you almost don't even know what is what. And for instance, if you look at it, we're all familiar with this tube, the KT88 and KT66 right well what did you ever wonder what this KT stands for it really stands for kinkless tetrode that's right it's a beam power tube it is a beam tetrode okay all those words kinkless tetrode beam tetrode beam power tube and I've even seen them go so far as to call it a beam pentode all of those terms are interchangeable, meaning beam power tube with these beam formers. And that is, and they are not true pentodes. They are different. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, little info on that. So I hope that helps you to kind of understand, you know, the evolution of all this and how it came to be and I'm sure that I left a lot of things out and I'm sure maybe a few of my descriptions aren't the most accurate so again you guys will not hurt my feelings if you come in and say well Tony it's actually it's this way I'm cool with that um, we all want to learn I'm posting this up here so hopefully some of you will join in the conversation in the comments down below and uh, and so forth but really what what I want to do next is I have always heard just I've heard you know from people that I've worked with over the years that the 7591 is technically supposed to be more similar to an EL34 and it is supposed to be a true pentode and it does have a different pinout than the 6L6s and the KT88s and KT66 5881 all those guys different pinout but more importantly it's supposed to be a pentode but when I look inside here it almost looks like 
this one, which is an original Fisher tube made in USA, looks like it's a beam tetrode. So that's where I'm at with this. I aim to find that out. And, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and in the next video, we're going to just go through my box of tubes and try to find some that match up that we can use on our Fisher amplifier. So thanks for hanging with me on this long talk. <laughs> and uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to take one of these apart. And again, this is an edit of the video, uh, a reshoot. So it's going to be a little bit pieced together. And I'm doing that on purpose because I wanted to kind of go over this a little more clearly than I did in my first uh, attempt. So let me cut this back into where I was and uh, we'll finish the video. And uh, we'll see you again soon. On our standard pentode tube, you have your plate on the outside. So this is your anode on the outside of the tube. So if we look at our tube here, this outer part that we're looking at, this black part here, that's your anode or your plate. Then in order from the plate down, the first grid that's in there, okay, and this, in this would be, you can't really see it without breaking the tube open. But the first grid that's closest to the anode is going to be your suppressor grid. Then the next one in from that is going to be your screen grid. Then the next one in from that is going to be your control grid. Then inside from that is the actual cathode, which is this little, this little stove pipe right here. And then running up the middle of that stove pipe, you actually have your filament or your heater. They call it the heater because it heats the cathode in order to burn off that cloud of electrons. So that's how a pentode is, is put together. And what they found is without actually using that third grid, they replaced it with what's called a beam forming electrode. And if you notice that beam forming electrode is kind of like a metal channel on each side and they very tightly focus that electron beam between the cathode and the anode. And that's what this, it actually forms the electron beam. That's why it's called a beam power tetrode or a beam tetrode. And by having this in there, they found that this actually eliminates or greatly reduces that anode kink region. Okay, so you don't have that region of negative resistance like you did before with the regular tetrode. Now, since this is technically not a actual grid, you can see there's no spiral windings there or anything. This is not considered a pentode, but really, when you think about it, there are still five elements, are there not? You have a cathode, you have an anode, and then you have your your uh, control grid, your screen grid, and your beam forming electrodes, which would take the place of your suppressor grid. It's just a suppressor beam, I guess, or a suppressor element. So you still have five elements, and this is where some of the confusion comes from. So if you look inside this, this is a 6L6. It's an old one from Seaberg out of a jukebox. I've had this thing for years. It's actually still a very good tube. It's in works perfectly in great condition. But if you look, I don't know if you can see it in this one. You can kind of see it. So if I zoom in and I get a flashlight, you see where the light is shining? See that little part that's lit up real bright? It's, so here's your anode, and then this top mica insulator is here, but between the mica insulator, right there, that tiny little channel, that's, that is your beam forming element. There's one there, and there's one there. Hope you can see it. I can see it really clear on the viewfinder of the camera, so I'm hoping you're seeing it too. And this is a beam power tube. So that's what, and the 6L6 is actually one of the first ones that was a functional beam power tube. So it came out originally as a necessity to get around a patent, but as they found out later, 
there were some characteristics of the beam power tube that actually were made the tube react a little bit differently from a pentode. Now, all things aside, a beam power tube and a true pentode tube, like this, um, really achieve the same results. It's just some of the characteristics of, the, of that tube um, are slightly different, so the, some of the designs of the actual circuit that you'd use it in would be a little bit different. That's why you can't just drop a pentode in place of a beam power tube without making a couple minor changes. It will work just fine, but you won't get the maximum performance out of it unless you change a few things. Um, for instance, your grid leak resistors and some things like that are going to be a little bit different because of, of the input how it works and again I'm no super expert so come in here guys and and add to this or correct me whatever I, I'm not <laughs> I will not be insulted if you correct me as long as you do it politely um, anyway so this is a beam power tube now these are supposedly true pentodes is what I understand them to be is what a 7591 is. I do not believe these are beam power tubes. However, when you look inside, well, when you look inside, I don't know if you can see it. So here's an original made in USA 7591. And if you look, you can see down in there, let's see if I can get the right angle here you can see two little curved beam forming elements so this may be an actual beam power tube I'm not sure and when you look inside the little holes little perforations of the anode you don't see an actual grid in there do you you actually see a solid metal object which would indicate to me that this is actually a beam power tube now here's the problem, especially with tubes like the EL34, the 6CA7, that family of tubes. Some of them, the original design made by Phillips and Mullard were actual true pentodes, just like this 7189, just bigger, higher powered. However, to add confusion to it, some companies started manufacturing the 6CA7 as an actual beam power tube. They did not have the actual grid, uh, the suppressor grid, but rather they had an actual beam forming uh, channel in it, just like, just like these. So that's where the confusion gets. <laughs> and um, it's very interesting so here's what we want to do I have this old Radio Shack realistic lifetime um, if you ever see these usually the realistic tubes a lot of them are not very good some of them are but a lot of them are not this tube is shot you can see right in here where it's like melted burned I'm gonna sacrifice this tube we're gonna open it up and we are going to just see what's inside this thing, how it looks. So let me do that, and I'll be back. Well, I guess it's safe to say that this tube went to air. <laughs> um, so let's cut this thing off of here. You can see down here is all the pins going down into the glass envelope. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of cut them off as far down as I can so that we can get this out of the base and actually look at it and possibly disassemble it. Okay, it's all removed, and we can see where all the elements are connected. So you could see right here is your anode, and it's connected right onto the actual anode itself. And in the middle is your filament. So if we're very careful, we can actually remove it. And there it is. And that's your filament. Now the filament actually has a coating on it, and I'm not going to get into real 
great detail, but this coating on this filament helps preserve the life of it. And it actually is kind of self-healing, I guess you could say. If you burn the filament up, obviously it'll open, but what I mean by that is if you power the tube properly and run it properly, this filament can last an extraordinarily long time without opening or burning up. And it won't really reduce in size because of that white coating that they put on the outside of it. And I can't remember what that coating is. Any of you remember that? Uh, <laughs> put it down in the comments for me. So now that we have that apart, you can kind of see down in the center here, that, that hollow tube that the filament was in, that is actually your cathode. And the cathode, if you notice, connects right here to this little pin here. Now, right next to your cathode, you can see, is this tiny little wire here. And this is actually your control grid. This is your where you're actually going to feed your signal into, right here. I hope I'm staying on camera. <laughs> I'm having a hard time seeing all this. Um, so this is actually your control grid. The next one out, which is this pin right here, is going to be your uh, screen grid, which is positioned right next to the control grid. And you can see it's right there. And then the very outermost one is going to be your actual um, suppressor grid or your beam forming. Now on this side you could see there's holes in there. Let's see if I can get a light in here for you. And you can see this this side is perforated and you can see this outer part and so you can kind of see how the pins connected in there. I don't know if I can get this off of here. Let me see if I can get the bottom part off of this and then we can look inside. By the way, these two white discs are actually mica insulators. That's what they're there for. And they have this white powder on them that kind of sometimes with the oil your fingers will get on your fingers and things. That's why I'm wearing these gloves. So let me get that off. Okay, I now have the bottom insulator off. Let's see if I can work around the camera and get this pulled out of here. And look at that, would you? There it is. That's your tube. So, if you look right here, and you can see how this tube's burned up. <laughs> it's pretty cooked. But, take a look at that. These two outer elements right here are your beam formers. So this is actually a beam tetrode technically because that's what these outer things are. If this was actually a pentode this outer thing would actually be another spiral. It would be another coil. Okay, so you can see the element that's the, the little winding that's directly on this little tube here. Oh, I'm way off camera, sorry. This little element that's right on this tube here, you can see that's wound all the way up and where it's kind of white and gray burned up, that's your control grid. This next little winding right here on top of it, and you can see it in the light, this part right here, that's your actual screen grid. And then this is these little curved metal bars right here, right here and here are your beam forming. So that's, I guess I just learned something today because I was always told that a 7591 tube was actually a pentode, a true pentode tube. When in fact, at least this one is a beam power tetrode or a beam power tube. How about that? <laughs> you learn something new every day. That's why I wanted to do this. So, let's see if we can get this out. Uh, see if I can take this apart. Let me cut these ends off. Okay, 
There's the beam former. And let's see if we can get this out. There's your cathode. And the cathode, you can see this cathode is pretty badly stripped. That white powder is actually really important in, uh, in, the, active, in the action of this cathode. Um, without it, you actually do not, it, the tube loses its efficiency to be able to burn off electrons uh, for the heater. And then you can see there's two distinct windings here, and I don't know. Let's see if I can get them apart. So right here, the one I'm wiggling. Sorry, I'm off camera again. This, there's your control grid. So let's see if you can focus on that a little bit. There's your control grid. I don't know if, how well you can see it. And then this would be the screen grid of like, so basically if this was just a tetrode tube, you would not have this beam forming unit, but you would have the screen grid, the control grid, the cathode, and the heater, and then your anode on the outside. And that's your tube. And this part on the top is your actual getter. And this is what they electromagnetically f heat up. It'll turn cherry red. And that's what flashes the, the getter material inside the tube to finish evacuating all of the gases and everything out of the tube to, make, to complete the vacuum. But uh, there it is. That is a beam power tube. And I always thought that these 7591s were actually true pentodes. Notice how this one, this EL, EL84, 6PQ5, 7189, whatever you want to call it, notice how on the side when you look through here, all you have is these two rods running down here, one rod here and one here. And actually, the, there's another winding, another coil around there, and that's actually your, your suppressor grid. So this is actually what a true pentode would look like. Interesting, huh? So there you go. Little, uh, little bit of tube talk. Again, guys, I really want to hear what you all have to say about tubes. The more that we all share information um, in the comments, the more we can teach one another and the more we can learn from one another. Okay, I'm going to end this video right here, and when we pick up on the next uh, video, it's going to be um, measuring these tubes, and we're also going to do some work on those output transformer and power transformer and the power supply on the Fisher X101C. So uh, stay tuned for that. It'll be coming up soon. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I love the participation in the, in the comments section and so forth. I love sharing back and forth information. And I uh, hope to hear from you all. And I thank you all for participating again. Take care. Bye-bye.